Okay. Um, thank you very much for coming today. Um, so um, uh, welcome to the the session. It's called uh, International Cooperation for Artificial Intelligence and uh, Digital Governance. Uh, my name is Park kyung and I'm a faculty member at uh, KAIST, Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. So I'm, I'm really honored to um, moderate this session. Um, so um, we have actually the wonderful group of uh, distinguished speakers today. So we have uh, seven very interesting um, you know, um, talks, but basically this is the kind of networking session, but at the same time we we uh, we try to share our knowledge and information about um, you know the current uh, the landscape of research and also the policy uh, in this field of uh, AI and digital governance. So um, I'm very excited to uh, introduce uh, my speakers, um, who actually um, needs very little uh, introduction. So uh, we're gonna have uh, the seven um, you know talks, and then after that maybe we might want to have uh, some uh, the Q and A sessions to share um, our thoughts all together. So um, first of all, um, I'd like to introduce uh, the Matthew Liao, Professor Matthew Liao from um, NYU, um, who is actually the uh, currently in in, uh, in the states. So Matthew, are you here? Uh, I'm here. Sure. Uh, would you like to uh, share your thoughts, and then maybe um, we'll hear from Matthew, and then he's giving a uh, kind of very introductory and very fundamental um, questions for the digital governance from the perspective of human rights. Matthew, Thanks. the floor is yours. Thank you, Kyung. So hi, everybody. Uh, sorry I couldn't be there in person, but um, you know, very honored and delighted to join you. So you know, we all know that AI has very incredible capabilities. They're going to be able to help us develop medicine faster. In public health, they're going to be able to identify those who are at risk of being unsheltered, they're going to be able to help us with the environment. At the same time, these powerful AIs also come with dangers. So many people are aware uh, that the data on which AI is trained can be biased and discriminatory. Uh, at NYU and other educational uh, institutions, we're grappling with uh, ChatGPT and what that means for es writing essays and plagiarism. Uh, elections are coming up. People are worried that AI could be used um, uh, to, you know, sow disinformation and distrust and influence elections. Uh, AI is al already also being used in Ukraine and other wars. So there's a question of whether AI is leading us towards sort of mutually assured destruction. And so to make sure that AI produces the right kind of benefits for everybody and that, that doesn't just cause harm, uh, governments around the world are working really hard to try to come up with the right regulatory framework. Uh, so two weeks ago, President Yoon was at uh, NYU uh, of Republic of Korea, and he talked about a digital bill of rights. Um, in July, President Biden secured the voluntary commitment of a number of tech companies to secure three principles when using AI. So safety, security, and trust. Uh, the European Union is getting ready to adopt the EU AI Act, which would be one of the world's uh, first comprehensive laws on AI. And so this brings me to my lightning remarks today. So assuming that we should try to regulate AI in some ways, how should we go about regulating it? And so my students in my lab and I have been studying this issue, and we've structured this topic into the 5W1H framework. So the, you know, the first question is what should be regulated? So that is the object of regulation. So many people talk about regulating data because you know, how we collect them could uh, raise issues such as bias and, uh, and pri privacy. Other talk, people talk about regulating the algorithms because as impressive as, as they are, algorithms can also produce bad results. So take generative AI, like ChatGPT, it's known to hallucinate and make up stuff. There are also people who think that we should regulate by sectors. Uh, so for example, we should have regulations for self-driving cars, another set of regulations for medical devices, and so on and so forth. Um, and then uh, finally, the EU thinks that we should risk, uh, you know, regulate based on risks, sort of you know, whether the risk is going to be acceptable or too high or low, and so on and so forth. And the general issue here is that over-regulation could end up stifling innovation 
but under regulation could lead to harms and violations of human rights. So some of the questions that we can talk about is like, if someone wants to regulate large language models such as uh, ChatGPT, where would they even start? Would it be the training data? Would it be the models themselves? Would it be the application? Um, or another question we can ask is whether EU's risk-based approach, is that the way to go? Um, and we can talk about, more about that in Q&A. So let's turn to the question of why we should regulate. Well, there are many reasons. So we could regulate to promote national interests, for example, uh, in order to establish a country as a leader in AI. We could also legal, regulate for legal reasons to make sure that new AI technologies com, um, comport with existing laws. Or we can regulate for ethical reasons, for instance, to make sure that uh, you know, we protect human rights, and some say to make sure that AIs don't cause human extinction. And of course, as an ethicist, I would hope that all regulations would conform to the highest ethical standards. But is this realistic? For instance, in a country that's trying to win the AI race, you may feel that has no choice but to cut ethical corners. So how optimistic or pessimistic should we be that governments would per pursue AI in an ethical way? Um, is, uh, you know, we can make this discussion more concrete. Uh, a lot of people in 2015 already signed a letter uh, arguing that we should ban lethal autonomous weapons, but these weapons are already being used. Is AI race a good thing? If not, what do we need to avert an AI race? So now let's talk about who should be doing the regulating. Well, there are a number of parties and stakeholders here. So you got the, the, the companies, the AI researchers themselves, the governments, universities, members of the public. Now, some people, uh, especially from those in the tech industry are concerned that non-specialists would not know AI well enough to regulate it. Is this true? Should we leave the regulation to people in the know, to the experts? And other people think that we shouldn't just rely on industries to regulate the, themselves. Uh, why is that? And what's the role of pub, the public in regulating AI? And what's the best way to engage the public? So in the AI, we can also talk about when uh, we should begin the regulation process. That is when it, in the life cycle of a technology should we begin to regulate? So we can regulate at the beginning, which would be upstream, right? Uh, or we can regulate once a product has been produced, uh, which will be more downstream. We can also re regulate the entire life cycle from start to finish in, in every stage of the development. Now, companies will say that they already have a regulatory process in place for their products. So what I have in mind is independent external regulation. And in the U.S., at least, the regulations tend to be uh, more downstream, you know, external regulations for, take, for example, ChatGPT. It's already out there being used, and now we're just grappling with how we should regulate it, externally speaking. Downstream regulation is usually seen as being more pro-innovation and pro-companies. How feasible would it be for an external regulatory body to regulate uh, fast-paced AI research and development? Is downstream regulation enough, or should we be taking a more proactive approach and regulate earlier in the process to ensure more protection for humans? We can also ask where should the regulation take place? Here we can regulate at the local level, at the national level, at the international level, or all of the above. So how important is it for us to be able to coordinate at the international level? Are we gonna be able to do it effectively? We don't have a very good re record with respect to climate change. So can we be, you know, count on doing that uh, with respect to AI? What would it mean to regulate at a local level? And how can universities, for example, contribute to AI governance? And finally, we can kind of talk about how we should regulate. And by this, I mean, what kind of policy should we try to enact when regulating AI? So ideally, we're looking for policies that can keep pace with innovation and won't stifle it. Um, at the same time, we're, we hopefully, these policies will be enforceable, for example, through our legal system. Uh, many people talk about transparency, accountability, and explainability as being important tools in AI regulation. Are those enough? If not, what other policies do we need? So, um, you know, I've been doing a lot of work on something called the human rights framework, where 
I think you know we should uh, think about regulating from a human rights perspective. We we should make sure that people's human rights are protected and promoted through AI, and that's what the purpose of the regulation. So let's just go back and sort of apply. So you know the human rights framework is kind of like an ethical framework, right? It says that the ethics should be prior to a lot of these discussions. And I already mentioned, you know, there are questions about whether that's realistic or not. But ideally, you know, we should make sure ethics is at the forefront. What should it regulate? Well, on a human rights framework, you might think we should regulate. Uh, like we should look into everything, at least consider everything, the data, the algorithms by sectors, uh, any uh, and by risk, like anything that could impact human rights, like there should be some sort of human rights impact assessment uh, for these technologies. Uh, who should do the regulating? Well, on the human rights framework, it says that everybody has a responsibility. Human rights belong to everybody. Everybody has an obligation. So companies, researchers, governments, universities, the public, we all have to be proactive in engaging in this, you know, sort of regulation process. Uh, when should we regulate? Well, the human rights framework thinks that, you know, uh, it, it seems to point towards a life cycle approach. So we should sort of at every stage look to make sure that, uh, you know, do some sort of human rights impact assessment, making sure that it doesn't undermine human rights. I'll talk, I can answer in Q&A whether, like, how that could be feasible. Um, and where should we regulate? Well, the human rights framework is global. It, it's, it's, it's all of the above. You know, we need to do it internationally. We need to do it nationally and we need to do it locally. And finally, how should we regulate? Like sort of, is it gonna be enforceable? I think that's gonna be the biggest challenge to a human rights framework or really any framework. I don't think this is a problem exclusive to the human rights problem, but it's certainly a big problem, which is the enforceability. I, I don't think we have a very good track record. And so one of the challenge for, of challenges for all of us is how can we get something together where we can actually make it binding and people will actually be willing to uh, comply with it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so uh, thank, thank you also to, uh, for mentioning about the KAIST and the NYU recent relationship uh, for the research collaborations. So uh, KAIST and NYU together with uh, uh, Matthew and Daniel Bielhoff and um, Claudia Ferreria um, and also Professor Soyoung Kim and Tasomni here. So we've been leading uh, this collaboration for the uh, digital governance and AI policy research. So let's move on to the Professor Tasomni from KAIST, Graduate School of Science and Technology Policy. So, okay, sure, with a further delay. Sure. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, could I have my slides on, please? Oh, clicker. Oh, there you go. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so I know this is, uh, I know we don't have a lot of time, um, so I figured I would spend the time to introduce the kind of work that I'm doing and introduce the lab that I have at KAIST Korea. So I have a lab called the, um, the AI and Cyber Physical Systems Policy Lab. It's called AI and CPS Lab. And um, we basically study how AI-based infrastructures or infrastructures that try to incorporate AI in the future try to address and promote environmental sustainability. So more specifically, uh, we look at energy transition and the technologies involved with that would be smart meters, smart grids, renewable energy technologies. Um, we also look at transportation, such as automated vehicles and unmanned aerial vehicles, which are drones, and data centers. Um, obviously, data centers are not specifically AI-focused, but they store the data that AI collects and ensures the reliability and the validity of AI technologies. And I actually have been criticized for being way too broad and not having a focus and studying everything, um, which is fine. I, I, I can take you know, constructive criticism, but <laughs> um, I also think that it's really important to look at everything in a very harmonized and holistic way, especially when we're trying to address sustainability. And when we look at infrastructures and when we look at energy and transportation in particular, they are really in interconnected. So for example, right now we're trying to use EVs as batteries and how each household can have their own battery using and using EVs as batteries. We can use renewable energy more sustainably and so on. Um, so that's basically, I, I, I'm trying to build like a harmonious um, 
infrastructural system in my mind somehow um, and I'm getting there hopefully and I'll hopefully get there in about 10 to 20 years um, but right now it's still kind of uh, fuzzy so the current projects uh, I don't really want to go into too much detail but um, uh, there are there are these five ongoing projects right now. The first one is regulating data centers. We don't have a lot of regulations on data centers, res especially regarding climate change, um, globally, internationally, not just Japan or Korea, but just everywhere in the world. The United States has the most number of data centers in the world, and the U.S. is not really known for their you know, hardcore federal regulation, uh, which means that it's often up to left up to the state level governments like California or, um, you know, Tennessee, where I was. And those kind of governments may do not ha often do not have the expertise on data centers to propose any type of regulations. So that's um, that's one of the projects. Another is the media analysis of energy transition obstru obstruction in Korea. Um, and we have a uh, the student who's working on this sitting there in the back, and um, he's done a wonderful job so far. Um, his name is Ubam, and we're looking at how um, how different types of media analysis, media outlets show how um, the the energy transition in Korea has not really gone from uh, oil-based energy to renewable energy but instead all better energy to natural gas. So there's, there's a transition and it's slightly better, but it's not great. <laughs> and we are trying to see how that actually, um, how that kind of obstruction happens in the media outlets. Um, the third one is the quantitative analysis for the need of social science in automated vehicle AV is the self-driving car automated vehicle research. Lots of um, automated vehicle research so far has been focused on more technological fixes, we need more sensors, we need LIDAR, we need more radars, we need more cameras, and then we need more these kind of infrastructures around the road, and we need these wires under the road. And we are actually, we show using quantitative and statistical methods that social science is the, needs, social science needs to be involved in order for us to understand the AV technology much better. Um, the fourth one is a bit of my small ambition and my my little personal side project is that I'm a sociologist by training, but I also study science and technology studies. So I try to merge NLP, multi-level uh, perspective by Frank Hills, uh, which is the science and technology studies, and Pierre Bourdieu's, who's a sociologist study, uh, sociologist um, uh, theory of forms of capital, and that's um, a theoretical work that I'm doing. And I'm also doing um, some work on data donation to this um, to promote data privacy and to promote uh, more sustainable data management and collection. And I also want to, I, I know we don't have it on there, but I also want to quickly mention the project that um, Professor Park, Professor Kim and I are doing together with NYU, Kai's project, which is that we are looking at uh, how privacy is contextualized in different geographical regions based on their culture and based on their history. And when we look at privacy, we can't just, and we have tried to do this with lots of technologies like cars, all cars need to have seat belts, right? Everywhere in the world. But with um, privacy, it's really difficult to have that kind of very concrete regulation that's universally applied because everyone has a different understanding of what privacy really is. So we're trying, we, we collected, uh, we're, we're planning to collect the data. We just passed the, um, the International Review Board, which is the ethical, you know, you have to do like an ethical review before you do a survey. So uh, we just passed the ethical review and we are planning to do a survey on how those kind of um, privacy regulate, pri how people perceive those privacy issues and how the public would interact with those um, potential privacy issues in the future. And I think that's it for me, and I, I really look forward to the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dasom Lee. So now, uh, right next to me, um, you know, uh, the senior advisor from JICA, uh, Mr. Asuzi uh, Yamanaka-sensei. So uh, he's, he has uh, extensive uh, experiences in, uh, in the field of development. So I think he's giving us uh, um, kind of development perspective on how we can um, you know, address the challenges and opportunities of digital governance. Thank you. So, 
with the phone. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Park, actually, and then uh, distinct actually panelists here, and also the actually the audiences here. It's always very very hard to be the first sessions in the morning. So thank you so much for your dedications for actually you know being part of this actually sessions. Um, I'm essentially a practitioner, so I've been actually doing ICT for development for more than actually quarter centuries, which is actually quite scary to think about it. Um, so let me actually talk from the developmental perspectives. How does the digital governance actually can contribute? And also what are the threats of the you know, digital governance or digital technologies for the development? But since I'm uh, actually an optimist, um, so let me actually start from opportunities. So essentially, for example, like uh, new technologies like AI is essentially opening up a lot of uh, windows of opportunities in developing countries. And a lot of developing countries are using the AIs and other cutting edge technologies in order for them to actually to innovate and then provide actually coming up with different actually products and services, which is uh, really affecting um, their, their lives and also contributing to the social economic development. So it is really, you know, accelerations uh, of these kind of things are also giving opportunity for the reverse innovations. Um, I don't necessarily like the word reverse innovation because it sounds like it's very pretentious, but we believe, and I believe as well, that uh, a lot of actually next generations of innovations, wh whether it is the services or the product, will be coming back, will be coming out of the so-called developing countries or emerging economies. Um, because you know, one of the things that uh, they, they have plenty is the needs. Right? So they actually have a lot of socioeconomic challenges or needs. So that is actually is fueling the innovations. You know, when you look at uh, mobile money, for example, it came from Kenya. You know, it will never, never actually came out from country like Japan, where we're essentially actually still enslaved with uh, paper monies, right? Or coins. So that will not actually have happened without actually the needs of developing countries. Another interesting opportunity that we see is uh, digital public goods and digital public in infrastructures. That's a very big topic um, this year, especially, with uh, discussions with G20, where the India is really pushing for digital public infrastructures to bridge the gap uh, of the digital inclusions. Uh, so we are going to see a lot of interesting opportunities, and hopefully this time, um, that we are not seeing, we are not going to see the same kind of fate that we saw about the hype of open source and also uh, funding for, um, you know, ICT for development during the business process. Um, another very, you know, really encouraging signs in doing the business process is multi-stakeholders' involvement into the digital governance areas and policy making processes. Um, prior, um, you know, I'm old enough, so prior to actually the WISIS process, UN really did not actually have this multi-stakeholders approach. I mean, of course, I mean, during the, um, the first summit of the social, uh, social development summit in Rio, the civil society got involved in, but still it was not really this kind of multi-stakeholder approach. So, you know, IGF actually exemplifies this multi-stakeholder approach and how everyone can put their input into it. So let me actually go to the next. I tend to speak so much. So let me, you know, please, uh, the Professor Park, if I, if I speak too much, please cut it. Now, the challenges. Well, there is a lot of challenges to be still made. Um, you know, despite the fact that we actually had made huge progress in terms of digital inclusions, still 2.7 billion people remains to be unconnected in 2022. And still, there's a lot of issues of affordabilities, digital service, you know, digital device, uh, digital devices, affordabilities, also gender, and also the economic sort of inclusions as well. So, in a way, we it's essentially the the problem is the same, uh, you know, 20 years ago, but it became much more complex. Um, so, in that respect, the last 2.7 billion people, last 30 percent, is very difficult to reach out. So that is going to be essentially a huge issue that we need to tackle on. Another thing is um, three weeks ago, I was part of the digital um, SDG Digital Summit in New York. Still, if we cannot actually utilize digital technologies well, we will not be able to actually achieve SDGs. So that is going to be another very big challenge into that. And then in the governance side, yes, there's so many different actually governance challenges. 
Um, you know, we are, Japan is promoting cross-border transactions of data, called DFFT, and that is also, you know, becoming a lot of issues in terms of what would be the best examples, what would be the framework to do that. Personal privacy, so, you know, professors from NYU was talking about, how, what are we going to do with the personal privacy and also human rights issues? Cyber security is another issue, you know, because we've seen cyber wars now. AI, internet, and the data fragmentations, also another thing. You know, they are frag fragmentations, you know, who, would, who has the right actually to cut the internet? You know, all these things. And also miss and then this and the money informations. You know, with the uh, advent of the AI technologies, this is going to, how can you actually tell the reality to the fake? That's going to be a huge issue. And also, developing countries, especially, how can you actually incorporate the voices and the input? Because they're still not fully involved in the rule making or the framework making process. So uh, we really need to engage with them and then give them the opportunities because they actually present probably more than you know, so-called G7 or uh, even, even G20 words. So how can you do that? And also, the lastly, uh, data and information flows are still one directional. You know, they, this is actually getting very big frustrations among the developing countries because they have a big concerns of this data colonizations or data oligopolies with, you know, especially with the big techs. And also data sovereignties. I think this is a very big issue. What if we actually, if they are going to put critical national information on the cloud in, so for example, like in US, which actually laws and regulations actually is going to regulate this data? If it's a national so, you know, sovereign data, shouldn't that uh, data owner should have the right to do it? But currently, the law is actually of the United States. So these are among s some of the challenges that we really need to address in order to really you know, fully utilize the power of digital technologies for development. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, we have a uh, human right perspective um, from Matthew and also infrastructure perspective and uh, digital governance uh, and also development um, perspective and the development cooperation for the international um, relations um, from different kind of uh, stakeholders. So now uh, we're moving on to the uh, Professor Rafik Hadif um, from you know, Kyoto University School of Informatics. So uh, it's giving us uh, the, the perspective of maybe the digital inclusion. So. Okay, sure, Lafik. So thank you, Professor Park, for the invitation, and uh, thank you, everyone, for being here this early uh, time of the day. So uh, my name is Rafik Hezfi. I'm currently an associate professor in the Department of Social Informatics at Kyoto University. So uh, I mostly do work on uh, AI, but uh, in a way I try to deploy it into society to solve a number of uh, problems, going from SDGs, LSI, to the most recent uh, uh, ethics-related uh, uh, issues. So uh, the work we do is uh, multidisciplinary by nature, and one of the topics that I've been working on most recently, perhaps the past two years, is uh, digital inclusion. And uh, I take digital inclusion here, particularly inclusion in a uh, very global way, in the sense that uh, inclusion sometimes means equity, sometimes means uh, self-realization, autonomy, etc. So I'll explain exactly what it means here. So uh, it's uh, one of the key elements of uh, modern society in the sense that uh, it's uh, a way of allowing the most disadvantaged individuals of society in um, uh, um, to having uh, access to uh, ICT technology. And this is uh, more like a answering the question of the uh, how. I mean, uh, what kind of activities allow us to include uh, these uh, members of society? And uh, the goal here is to uh, allow more equity. So equity here is a more, uh, let's say, um, inclusive um, uh, and uh, uh, meaningful um, uh, way to define uh, meaning for an, an individual in society. So. Um, the question of equity answers the what here. So what's the goal uh, of an individual of society? So uh, this connection here leads us to uh, something more global, which is self-realization. Uh, and this includes all members of society. In a way, if we allow uh, self ec um, digital equity, uh, we'll allow individuals to, um, uh, uh, let's say, uh, meet their uh, autonomy and also um, fully live their lives. So the question now is, uh, or the uh, topic that I'm working on, is how to um, 
enable this using most recent technologies, not just ICT, but AI in particular. So I'll take one case of a um, uh, st uh, uh, case study uh, we've been uh, conducting for the past, let's say, two years. Uh, it was very difficult, uh, challenging, uh, because it kind of addresses multiple um, uh, problems in society. So digital inclusion here is uh, equated with uh, gender equality, uh, empowering women, so uh, it's a study that was conducted in Afghanistan, and uh, the focus here is, is uh, women inclusion. So um, the problem, the main problem here was, first of all, conducting the study itself in Afghanistan. This came at the same time where the um, uh, Afghan uh, government was uh, collapsing. And uh, apart from the logistics there, we had also the already uh, established, let's say, problems there, like uh, gender inequality, uh, insecurity, so it was very difficult to conduct, plus the ICT limitations in Afghanistan. Uh, fast forward two years later, we managed to conduct the experiment. I mean, initially, it was a plan for 500 participants from Afghanistan and then uh, narrowed down to 240. So the main uh, target here is basically how to build an AI that could be deployed in an online, let's say, setting uh, where uh, mostly women have the ability to use smartphones to communicate and also deliberate. So uh, the AI was found to actually um, enhance a number of things. So one of them uh, is the diversity of the contribution that women uh, were uh, providing in these kind of online debates. The second one, and most importantly, the, uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, we found out that uh, this kind of conversation like reduces inhibition. I mean, uh, Middle Eastern societies in particular are known for... Uh, limiting the, uh, let's say, the, um, the, um, the reach of uh, women in terms of uh, like uh, freedom of expression and also uh, uh, raising particularly issues or, qu or problems related to their livelihood. Uh, the third uh, element was uh, found with uh, this kind of technology is uh, increasing ideation. We found that AI allows actually women to uh, provide more ideas with regard to the uh, local problems there, like, um, let's say, um, uh employment, uh, let's say, family-related issues. So this is one uh, practical case of um, conversational AI, which is, uh, in a way, uh, building on uh, what's all known with the large language models, uh, chat GPT, et cetera. It's, this is more advanced and, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, problem-solving uh, approach to uh, conversational agents. So, uh, yeah, so this is a... Uh, particular uh, practical example of uh, using conversational life for social good and the deployment was done in Afghanistan. So uh, I'm looking forward to your questions and uh, yeah, that's all for me. Thank you very much, Lafi. Um, actually, the Rafik is um, has been leading um, you know, the democracy and AI, um, the, the research group in IJKI, uh, International Joint Conference on AI. Um, and then we'll also have a conference in, uh, next year in Seoul. So uh, I think there, there was also a very uh, interesting discussion in, in Hong Kong in, in, uh, in August. Um, so you know, uh, today is a you know, Japanese national holiday. It's a sports, uh, sports day, right? So it's a I think we are doing a lot of brain exercise today. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, I think it's very ambitious um, um, and very interesting um, talks and sessions today. So uh, we're moving on to the uh, Professor Li Ming Zhu, um, School of Computer Science and Engineering um, from um, Univers University of uh, uh, um, New, New South Wales. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, you'll talk about um, um, you know, d democratizing the AI uh, from the perspective of uh, CS. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much for having me. Um, right. So um, I'm a professor from U uh, Uni University of New South Wales, but I'm also a research director at uh, CSRO's Data Teach One. So CSRO is Australia's national science agency. We have around uh, 6,000 people working in the areas of um, uh, agriculture, energy, mining and of course AI. So Data Teach One is it's AI digital and data business units. I also work uh, quite um, internationally on uh, with OECD AI and some of the ISO standards on AI trustworthiness. And Australia also have a national AI center was established uh, 18 months ago, which is hosted by Data Teach One. Uh, its main remit is not research, but AI adoption, uh, especially responsible AI adoption. So um, very briefly on Australian's journey. So Australian back in 2019 have developed Australian's AI ethics principles, which is developed by Data Teach One at the time. Um, 
commissioned by the Department of Industry and Science, but with uh, industry consultation. And the principles, if you look at that, that at them, it's not really uh, that surprising. A lot of uh, international organizations and each country have developed those. But I want to draw your attention is, you know, on the first two or three, it's really the human-centered uh, values, uh, especially the plural of values. We, we realize the trade-offs and the different culture and the inclusiveness uh, in, in human value. Uh, environment well-being, and Australia is a, a fair go country, and uh, so fairness is high up in there. But then we have the traditional uh, quality attributes, I would say, for any systems. Uh, but AI will pose a very uh, unique challenge to, the, to them, such as privacy, security, reliability, and safety. And then there are additional um, interesting quality attributes like transparency, explainability, contestability, and accountability, which is uniquely uh, uh, in, in the AI context. So uh, since then, since 2019, that's been four years, so Australian has been focusing on operationalizing these principles. We have done a lot of industry consultation case studies and how I get industry feedback. And importantly, Australian, the minister, the picture is our minister for science and industry, Minister Husick, has launched Australian's Responsible AI Network, which is Australian companies and organizations commits to Responsible AI uh, through governance mechanism. They have to commit to three, at least three, uh, AI governance mechanism principles uh, to within their organization to be part of the member and featured uh, and sharing their knowledge. And we are also, uh, there's a book coming up called Responsible AI, Best Practices for Creating Trustworthy AI Systems based on the work uh, we have done and there are three key Australian industry case studies in that book. Um, so what is our approach? I, I think the key thing is we uh, realized uh, is a lot of best practices, uh, they need context. They need to know when to apply them, and also there's both pros and cons of these best practices. And the best practice needs to be connected. We also see people at the governance level, let's have a response to AI ethics committee, let's have some auditing mechanism at the governance level, doing great things but not connected to the practitioner. The practitioner is your ML engineers, AI engineers, uh, software engineering, AI engineering developers. How do we connect all these best practices so uh, people collaborate? So we have developed a responsive AI pattern catalog, uh, which you can easily find uh, by searching, and connects governance patterns, which we mean, you know, probably the people in this room are most, uh, mostly interested in, process patterns, meaning software development process and AI engineering process uh, from, uh, from a development process point of view and the product patterns, which you see all the uh, metrics, measurement on a particular product, how to evaluate them. The key thing is they are connected, and you can navigate uh, around them and, and to have a whole of system uh, assurance. At this moment, uh, a lot of AI governance is not about AI model itself, uh, even ChatGPT. There are many components, AI and non-AI components outside the uh, AI model. You know, every prompt you put into ChatGPT is not a true prompt going back to the model. Additional text are added to those uh, texts you have added. You know, things like simple, please always answer ethically and positively. So those kind of prompts will be attached into every single prompt you put into it. That's a system level guardrail. And many, um, so this is a very simplistic reason, uh, uh, example, but many organizations who leverage large language models and AI can put their unique context-specific guardrails to leverage uh, the benefits while uh, having some guardrails. And those kind of patterns, mitigations, need to connect with the responsible AI risks that every company can um, find as part of their typical AI risk, uh, or risk registry systems, and we have developed many of uh, such uh, question banks uh, that uh, you can ask questions about your organization and uh, making uh, responsible AI risk assessment part of that. So that you can find more information in some of the papers I listed here, or uh, search online, and this has been featured uh, by the communication of ACM as one of the most impactful projects in the East Asia and Oceania region recently. Um, so we're very happy to share more experience with the audience here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, today's speaker is actually providing a lot of insights on how we can actually collaborate together uh, from different stakeholders in the global proce uh, global shaping process of AI frameworks. We, we have also the Australian cases and uh, Korean cases and 
I would say, a little bit like market-driven U.S. approach, and also we also need engagement from the developing countries. So I think uh, that's why it's uh, very timely. Uh, today's session is very timely. So uh, I think we have uh, Takayuki Ito uh, Sensei uh, in online. So uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Takayuki Ito from Kyoto University. Hi, no. so sure. Okay. Okay. Sure. Um, floor is yours. Do you hear me, right? Yes, yes. Okay, sure. Okay. Uh, I, I'll share my slide, okay? All right. So, uh, thank you. Thank you for inter introducing me. So, uh, I'm Takari Kito from Kyoto University. Uh, I, I, I'll talk about the current one of my current projects uh, towards hyper democracy. It's a uh, uh, empowered uh, crowd scale discussion support system. So uh, we are working for the the <clears throat> the high, to to develop the hyper democracy platform, uh, where uh, the multiple AI uh, try to uh, help uh, group decision and consensus building support. So. Basically, in the current social network, uh, there are many uh, social problems like fake news and digital uh, gerrymandering and filter bubble and echo chamber. It's a, a very, very uh, important problem. So here, uh, by using uh, artificial intelligence like the uh, chat GPT and LLM, uh, we are trying to uh, solve that. So <clears throat> actually, we, we, we have been working for uh, this kind of uh, projects uh, for 10 years. Uh, from 2010, uh, we started to create a system called Coragri system, uh, where the uh, human facilitator tried to uh, facilitate and support the uh, uh, consensus among the online participants. And then uh, from 2015, uh, we created the Agri system, where uh, one AI uh, a agent uh, supported the uh, group decision among online participants. So here uh, we use AI uh, uh, to support the human collaboration. And then now we are working for hyper democracy platform, where the many AIs, AI agents uh, try to uh, support participants uh, support crowd scale uh, discussion. So uh, this is an overview of the Diagri system. Uh, here, uh, as you can see, the, the people discuss by using text uh, chat. And then uh, these texts are, are recognized by our AI and then uh, structuralized in the database. So basically by using the structure, structure, structuralized discussions, discussion, uh, AI facilitator try to uh, interact with the uh, online participant. Uh, here, uh, uh, actually, we started started this project in 2015. We didn't have any uh, chat GPT, but uh, by using our classic AI uh, technology, uh, we realized that. So here, uh, by using LLM or uh, GPT, uh, we are now working for more sophisticated AI, actually. So this is one uh, case uh, case study about about Diagri. Uh, we used the Diagri system in Afghanistan, uh, in, in particular in the uh, 2021 uh, August. Uh, there, uh, American troops uh, left, left from uh, Kabul city in Afghanistan. There, uh, we opened uh, we opened in public the Diagri, and then. We gathered many opinions and the, uh, the, the voices from the uh, civilian in Kabul city. So <clears throat> as you can see, uh, our AI can analyze the, the <coughs> type, the, the, the opinion types and, and the characteristics. So uh, from, <clears throat> from August 15, where uh, when the American troop left, the, the number of issues problems uh, increased drastically. Uh, that it's uh, uh, shown in, in red box in the central graph. So <clears throat> uh, we are working uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, the uh, UN 
United Nations habitat and uh, uh, many other uh, NPOs about these these kind of things. So uh, now we are extending the uh, AI AI facilitator to uh, many AI agents, and then uh, this is the current uh, multi agent architecture. Uh, now we are we are testing this uh, agent uh, architecture. So this is a conclusion. So yeah, uh, we are now uh, <coughs> developing uh, next next generation uh, high, next generation AI based uh, group decision support system, and uh, <coughs> it's called a hyper democracy platform. So yeah, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, actually, Professor Takayuki Ito has been pioneering is uh, um, like intersection um, uh, interdisciplinary research uh, in the intersection between AI and democracy. So I think yeah. uh, he provides a lot of insights on uh, the importance of a multidisciplinary approach. Um, we, um, especially in the the research field, we uh, we have to work together with the uh, the policy scholars and also development scholars and also engineering scholars as well. So um, right, so we are on time right now. So I'm feeling very relieved. <laughs> so we have our last speaker, um, Seungyeon Kim from KAIS. Are we ready? Uh, okay, sure. Uh, We're sharing some insights from the um, uh, development uh, field. Uh, hello, my name is Seungyeon Kim. I'm currently a PhD student uh, studying under Professor Kyung Yeo Park. But previously in my life, before the peaceful life of a graduate student, I was um, a program officer for uh, an institute called the Korea Development Institute, responsible for policy rec uh, pr producing policy recommendations for developing countries. So what the one of the stark real realizations that I realized was that um, uh, in in the times that I worked in, at KDI as a program officer, I've only been to developing countries. So my passport records do not go above the annual GDP per capita of ten thousand dollars per year. So I haven't been anywhere. Um, so this is the most advanced country that I've been to overseas in many years. <laughs> and um, well, what I realized is that that when I came to KAIST, the, oh, the, I was exposed to this, all these discussions about AI, uh, ChatGPT, bioethics. Etc. Uh, extremely advanced uh, uh, technologies, cutting-edge technologies that are, that is going to change everything. But then I thought about. Uh, um, then my thoughts overlapped. Uh, what what happens when these cutting-edge technologies are overlapped with uh, what I saw in the developing countries, which have a very different societal and econ economic context? So I'd like to share three snapshots that provide some some peak, not insight. I wouldn't say uh, just peaks into how. The, all these discussions, insightful discussions we've had today, may develop in the developing world. So, so this is a snapshot of a of a photograph uh, taken in uh, November 16, 2016, in Medellin, Colombia. So, if you've seen Narcos in Netflix, you're probably familiar with the city. This is the narco capital of the world. And uh, this is, if you see a uh, little bit below, you'll see that there is uh, called. Uh, uh, Bienvenidos a Calle Uno, which means uh, welcome to Area One. Area One is the zip code for the poorest neighborhood in the Colombian cities. So this city was it used to be before the introduction of a cable cars, uh, which was a, a revolutionary transport mechanism. It was actually isolated from the entire city of Medellin. So it was a breeding ground for cartels, uh, drug dealers, drug smug smugglers. Cops would not go in there. They would say, I'm not going in there. Uh, but because of the cable cost, people were able to get jobs and come out of the city and have equal opportunities to education, jobs, and uh, capital to, to, borrow, uh, to borrow money, et cetera, for banking, et cetera. But what wasn't publicized was that uh, drug cartels were using this uh, ca new cable car. They, will, they would hide cocaine inside the replaceable parts. And then this would become an automated distrib distribution mechanism that was not publicized for a very long time. But uh, what if cable cars do this to the drug cartels? And what, what are they going to do when they get their hands on ChatGPT and AI? Uh, so it, it's uh, something to think about. And also, what the drug cartels were able to thrive in these regions because a dollar could bribe anyone in the entire neighborhood. You could, for $10, you could basically make people do anything. 
what can you do with a brand new laptop, uh, an iPad that's connected to generative AI, and what can they do? Uh, uh, what can the police do? What can the government do against such matters? So uh, one snapshot is unequal opportunities and how that ex exposes existing uh, social and economic problems. The second snapshot is one of uh, lovely pictures uh, that I've taken in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. This was in 2018. Uh, this is a scene that I will probably remember for a very long time. This is a scene of, of an official explaining to uh, us, uh, the Korean researchers, about w the current system of the Ethiopian public finance system, the electronic digital finance system. So the the line, I would, I would not forget this line, so the the tax system runs on Microsoft. The tax expenditure system and budget planning system runs on Oracle. And we haven't had a uh, digital system for auditing system yet, but we will uh, soon, as soon as we get the funding. So for one government, you have three different information systems running simultaneously that do not communicate with each other, that cannot communicate with each other. So fragmentation, on, on an enormous level. And why is there fragmentation at the govern in the core governance structure of distribution of financial resources at the Ministry of Finance? Why is that? Because they're financed by different institutions, like the World Bank, um, by UNDP, et cetera. They're financed by different institutions who are connected to different um, uh, service providers who in turn provide very little parts of the government. And no one agency can provide one Comprehensible, so comprehensive solution for the entire government. So what you have is extreme fragmentation of ICT and information systems in government. Uh, th the third snapshot is um, uh, I spent uh, two weeks in Equatorial Guinea. I don't know if anybody's been to Equatorial Guinea. So it was the unhealthiest time of my life. I was uh, basically uh, half unconscious because of the malaria vaccines I that I had to take every two days. And uh, uh, so this is the president, um, Nguma Mbasso, uh, speaking at the Equatorial Guinea National Economic Conference. So all the ministries were there, all the ministers were there, uh, all the high level profiles of the government were, th were there. But the entire conference was run and executed by Chinese uh, officers from the mainland China. So, so we, Every staff that, uh, except for the participants, every staff would be Chinese from the mainland. So, and after about a week and spe spending a weekend there, it wasn't the, uh, it, it wasn't long until I found that the entire ICT infrastructure was basically dependent on one country, and one company, China, Huawei. So you couldn't get an internet connection, Wi-Fi, not anything. You can't send an email without having some sort of support from Huawei. So I thought this snapshot uh, provides a very um, a significant view into technology sovereignty. So it, in sum, uh, you have one uh, unequal opportunity that may, um, that may be extravagated into a uh, whole variety of uh, societal problems, and two, uh, fragmented uh, ICT structures that create problems for governments, and technology sovereignty that ties in developing countries with companies and other governments and international agencies that provide a very complicated picture for the developing world, and, and for the developing world to become more advanced and to be to actually transform into a developed world. I think this is, uh, these three peaks are something that we should think about. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, so uh, we have uh, like five minutes to go, so I'd like to open up the floor, and then because we have uh, more than, I think, 30 attendees uh, in the session, thank you very much for your participation. So if you have uh, any uh, comments or questions, um, please um, raise your hand. Professor Seung Kim from KAIST. Uh. Could you? Uh, <laughs> First yeah. time doing this, but yeah. <laughs> okay. If I knew that I should be standing here, I wouldn't have, uh, have asked a question. But the question, I guess, um, is very much common to all of us because, uh, as just as Sinyan pointed out, the problem of uh, fragmentation uh, in a single country level, we are actually witnessing huge frag fragmentation of AI governance at the global level. We have something going on uh, at the World Bank, UN, various agencies of the UN and also even within single countries. So, and also we are approaching this problem from 
many different angles, right? Development perspective, uh, sociological, ethical, philosophical, CS, whatever. So the question is uh, uh, how we can actually uh, reduce this degree of fragmentation uh, when you talk about AI governance and other uh, mechanisms of regulation or issues. So someone, as you might know, or some circles around the world are talking about the need to create something like IAEA, version of AI, but then there are many limitations, of course, because of so different natures of uh, two technologies, you know, uh, nuclear technology is so centralized and it was born out of a very uh, dire uh, emergent situations during World War II, but you know, AI is uh, such a apparently democratic <laughs> technology because AI, anybody can uh, get touch upon some part of uh, AI. So my question is how you, uh, any of you uh, can address this question of uh, uh, the need and the way we can actually think about how we can actually reduce uh, this problem. <laughs> you see what I'm saying, right? Okay. Thank you very much. So if you don't mind, actually, why don't you just have uh, you know questions all together and then we'll We'll just address the questions. Please, uh, could you briefly introduce us yourself? And yes, then no problem. Hi, Thank I'm, you. Uh, I'm Sophie Kellehauger. I'm a diplomat from the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs posted in, in Geneva. So thank you so much for all your really interesting perspectives. I think um, we, of course, also see a need for global governance of AI. And just like my uh, previous uh, audience member, um, we also see this fragmentation. Uh, it was really good to hear, especially, of course, in the first presentation, the focus on, on human rights, which we also find very important, and the general multi-stakeholder engagement. This is a good example of engagement with the academia. Uh, so we see a need to take a, a really a risk-based approach, and, of course, uh, thank you for referencing also the EU AI Act as an EU member state. We uh, very much support that, that approach. I wanted to ask basically the same question as well. How do we approach this globally? We see this fragmentation. But instead, then I would like to come back to the first speaker's Professor Liao's um, point on follow-up mechanisms and monitoring. How do we afterwards then ensure that this uh, regulation is is implemented and um, and we can oversee, we have oversight and accountability afterwards? Thank you. Thank you very much. And gentleman here over here. Hello, good, hello, good day. My name is Peter Keen. I'm from Liberia, and I would like to ask a question based on the African perspective. I realize that we have some. I think most of we are from Asia region or you from, I mean, stayed in another continent. But the fact is, in Africa, we also are part of a global society. But then we're looking at how, what do you see as the impact of AI? The, the emerging is be becoming, the use the use is, is geographically limit, I mean, you know, limited. So most of the conversation here, it does, I, I, I saw only, uh, I mean, as a sample case of Equatorial Guinea, but we're looking at Africa as Africa, a lot of issues. And so what advice can you give most of our policymakers in Africa, in terms of how research can be I mean, extended and what can they do to ensure that as it seamlessly I mean, get to become a reality, what can Africa prepare for? And we do lack certain I mean, expertise. What are your advices for some of us youth and then our the larger uh, audience in Africa? That's my question. Thank you very much. Oh, okay, another um, questions or comments maybe? Um, hi, um, my name is Yasmin from Indonesia from the UN Institute for Disarmament Research. Um, so I do have a few questions, so please bear with me. Um, first of all, for the first speaker on um, a human rights-based AI framework, just to jump on the previous point that was made by a fellow audience member, on the question of enforceability, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the difference between human rights as a moral framework on the one hand, on the other hand, as a as a legal framework with the established international human rights law mechanisms, and what can we learn from the established case law that have um, been you know, established over the past years as IHRL was developed. Second, on the digital public good and the digital public infrastructure. Um, previously, I used to work at Chatham House, a London-based think tank. We did some research on that, and one of the questions that we were wondering of course, there is the importance of public stewardship, but at the same time, there's also the question of limited resources and the need for scalability, how do you deal with that? <laughs> and third, on conversational AI to advance women's inclusions, one of the questions that popped into my mind, it's great, it's got a lot of potential, but how do you deal with um, the availability of training data, um, whether it's in terms of um, data collection and data hygiene, um, that it's available in an equitable way? 
Um, so not just in terms of you know um, free in the way from biases, but also taking into account questions of, for example, some communities might need to be represented in in these models, but at the same time, others might want to be forgotten because of privacy and oppression risks. Um, how do you deal with that? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So right. <laughs> so if I if I may. It's, a, it's a wonderful comments and questions. So if I may just um, summarize with this keyword, fragmentation in the global AI governance and how we can actually collaborate together for that. And what can the African country especially you know, prepare for the AI strategy? And there are you know, uh, definitely the conflicting rationals uh, in you know, human uh, rights perspective and also digital public goods and how we can actually promote some, uh, you know, enhance the scalability and how we promote the digital inclusion in terms of a data collection and data analysis. So I'll give you, uh, Matthew, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Sure, um, I'll give you two minutes. Is it okay, okay for you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sure, sure. You're always, uh, so thank always you smart, right? Yeah, those excellent questions and great questions. The fragmentation question is just such a difficult problem. Uh, very quickly, I, you know, I think this is something that we need to all work together. We need to, it's multi, you know, multi-stakeholders. We need everybody involved in the conversation, the public, the government, the researchers, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, that sounds kind of vague. So here's something a bit more concrete. Um, I think Professor uh, Song Kim mentioned something about the nuclear energy. The, there's There are two things I want to say. Like, uh, I think the biomedical model is actually a pretty interesting thing to think about. Uh, if you think about drug discoveries, uh, there, uh, you know, there's a lot of innovation in the drug, uh, uh, you know, uh, arena. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, there's a lot of regulation. You know, we're protecting, uh, you know, people. There are a, a lot of human subject research. You know, a lot of sort of stuff that's not like high risk stuff. You know, not not trivial risk uh, things. And yet we can do it in a fairly responsible way. And the community, the international community, have basically coalesced around sort of different norms. Uh, you know, to sort of say, hey, we need to make sure that this process is safe. And I feel like we can do something similar with respect to AI, uh, you know, where, uh, you know, some stuff, maybe they're low risk. I, I like the EU-based uh, approach as well. I think sort of uh, some stuff that's low risk that, you know, we can kind of look at it and sort of say, hey, we don't need to worry that much about that if, you know, something is being used for games. But other things where, you know, in like medical devices, maybe we should need to pay more attention, especially if it involves, you know, humans. Um, and I'll just say one other thing, which is, I think there's a lot of sort of regulatory capture right now. A lot of people think, oh, my, you know, this is too, bis too big to be regulated. And I think it's just, it's useful to look at the history of regulation. Take airplanes, for example. Um, airplanes used to fall out of the sky every single day, right? And then at some point, people say, you know, we need to come, um, um, come together and regulate uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, uh, sort of the airline industry. So everything like from the engines and so on and so forth is regulated. And now airline, the airline industry is the safest, like, you know, so it's so safe to fly these days. And so I, I feel like we can do something similar as well. Uh, and so maybe those are indirect models where we can appeal to for, uh, to address things like fragmentation and, and, and things like that. So. Thank you, Matthew. Um, does anyone address um, to the questions or comments from you? Okay, sure. Well, thank you so much, actually. It's a very, very interesting questions. And um, I have a few, actually, <laughs> comments on this, actually, uh, fragmentations. Okay, fragmentations. Maybe perhaps we need to actually create AIGF, right? <laughs> Instead of IGF, AI Governance Forum. Um, you know, even the internet governance, Right, we've been talking about 20 years. We still have not actually came up with, a, with a suitable models. I think we need to actually come up with what is actually workable and it's the best examples uh, models instead of actually having a complete global regulations, which is very, very difficult and not very palatable for many, many stakeholders. So I think we need to actually have to come up with sort of best example, what is really you know workable solutions rather than actually having a concrete regulations on AI, I think. I think that's the way to go. Uh, in terms of Africa, yes. 
Actually, I actually work mostly in Africa, by the way. So <laughs> the last 12 years, 13 years, actually, I mostly actually worked in Africa, uh, mostly in Rwanda. So actually, AI is, is actually utilized very much so in African context as well. A lot of actually startups actually have been using AIs. And then, um, uh, you know, like um, um, other actually uh, database solutions. So I think there are actually a lot of solutions which is coming out. However, the human resources are limited. You're right. So there are different ways. There are actually a lot of actually advanced institutions now established in, in Africa as well, like Carnegie Mellon University in Africa, in Rwanda. Um, Ames, you know, Africa Institute of Mathematical uh, Science is in also in, Af in Rwanda as well. So that is also ways to advance that kind of initiatives. And also, I think developing con developed countries like, you know, Korea, Japan, for example, I have uh, quite many students actually who study AI and continue to actually do PhDs here in, in, the, in Japan. And one of them actually have uh, generative AI models for African languages. And he was, he was studying here, he was actually a research fellow at the Riken, uh, which is one of the top, actually, uh, research institutes. Unfortunately, he moved to Princeton <laughs> to continue his research. But so that's kind of sort of human resource capacity building initiative that, for example, JICA is actually known for, and also COICA, the Korean, and also other countries actually doing that. So I think you can take advantage of that kind of framework. Uh, about DPI and DPGs, yes. Um, <coughs> Scalability was always the issues on open source initiatives and also on ICT for development as well. But I think we're seeing a lot of interesting sort of DPI, like, uh, you know, the Indian MOSIP model, um, uh, <coughs> you know, that is scalable. They're actually serving like, uh, you know, ten, uh, 1 billion people basically, right? So that actually is seeing a lot of scalability beyond POC, which is, you know, hallmark for the ICT for development. And the lastly about women's inclusions. I think digital technology actually gives actually quite unique opportunities in terms of pseudonymizations. So sort of masking, sorry, sort of masking the gender, but basically giving the opportunity for the inclusions. I think much more so than like uh, in-person environment. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you very much. Uh, so before we close, I, I know we're running out of time. I'd like to just give a uh, um, couple of minutes and from Rafiq and <laughs> to Professor Zhu. So uh, um, Rafiq. Yeah, sure. Just a few words uh, with regards to the, uh, let's say the uh, empowerment of local commu communities, for example, uh, in terms of uh, the inclusion in terms of data collection, training, the avoidance of bias, et cetera. So uh, one approach we found is that uh, not just deploy a solution and a simple social experiment, but instead have a holistic approach where we tend to form local communities, let's say villages, municipalities, universities, schools, train them on how to use the whole, um, let's say, um, AI system. And then this is done for a few studies, but at the same time, it allows us to uh, build data sets to train these models for these communities. Because one of the things we encounter is that when you train these AIs, uh, obviously in English, I mean, you're biased towards one particular, uh, uh, let's say, uh, context. So uh, we've done this in Indonesia. So this was a uh, island called uh, West Nusa Tenggara uh, with the University, University of Mataram. We trained these data sets with Indonesian. And uh, currently we're focusing on the uh, Afghan case because uh, I think, uh, as we all know, there's a lot to do in Afghanistan, and uh, the case study that I uh, covered is mostly focusing on um, equity, women empowerment, uh, and of course, as I said, the uh, the data collection, the AI models are trained particularly for this context, and of course, they've been generalized. Uh, this year, it's for Afghanistan. Maybe I don't know. Uh, we'll try it in Iran. <laughs> I don't know next year. Yeah. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'll, I will be brave. I, I think on the fragmentation now, I'm going to be slightly controversial because from a science point of view, we see uh, they are all different stakeholder groups. We have great institutions, UN, OECD, WEF, you know, uh, and, and if, if they are paying attention to AI and AI governance, there's certainly I, I think it's, it's, it's valid because different stakeholder groups have slightly different concerns and the robust discussion between the groups and making trade-offs in some of this is going to be important. I don't see at that level uh, a fragmentation, but more of a more interest from different stakeholder groups. Comes to regulation, of course, uh, there is also the importance of both horizontal regulation, regulating AI as a whole, and there's a pros and the cons in that, and the vertical regulations on particular products, the interaction between them. 
uh, removing some overlaps is important, but there needs to be both rather than one way or another. But only one thing I think that shouldn't be in uh, fragmentation is science. Science is international, science is not value-based, and the, the scientific evidence and the advice to this policy and stakeholder groups uh, are really need to cl collaborate more. I see a lot of scientists, uh, research organizations here. I'm looking forward in collaborating with them. Thank you. Um, global platform for collaboration. So thank you very much for your participation today. And I'd like to continue um, you know, um, our uh, discussion. So, uh, uh, so please keep in touch. And then, so uh, before we close, actually, I'd like to particularly thank you know, uh, the Sung Hyun Kim and Juno Kwan, uh, doctor students from KAIST. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for your time and all the speakers. And um, if you um, leave your contact to the uh, Junho um, after this session, we'll uh, particularly just you know keep in touch with you after uh, this session. Thank you very much. Thank you.